Hello everybody, my name is Rob and I'm a postdoctoral researcher based in Vienna, Austria. And this is my brain, which we scanned using an MRI machine. But this is not the only scan. Over the last two and a half years, I've gotten a brain MRI about 100 times. I've also tracked my sleep using a scientific EEG machine 92 times and I've measured which bacteria are in my gut more than 200 times. I measure many, many more things and these things fall into three categories my body, my mind, and my environment. And of course, all these things interact with each other. All these measurements combined take about 11 hours per week. And to share with you what that looks like, for one week I recorded everything on video. But before I show you that week in my life, I have to mention that this is a serious scientific project involving several research centers with three major overarching goals. First of all, we wanna see how long-term changes in sleep patterns affect a person's brain activity. The second goal is to find out what the link is between your gut microbiome, so the bacteria in your gut and your brain activity. And finally, I have a more personal goal. I want to find out, can I use this data to live a happier, more productive and less stressful life? So my week of measurements starts off on Monday evening with a sleep EEG. And here you see Sebastian putting on the sleep EEG electrodes. In the top left, you see how long each of the measurements take. So putting on the EEG takes about 45 minutes to an hour. And these EEG electrodes actually measure my brain waves during my sleep. And in this way, we can track in detail what my sleep is like. Now then I cycle home with the sleep device to sleep with it at home. So the good thing is that I can sleep in my natural environment. So I turn on the device, sleep with it for the entire night. And the next day I go to the MRI machine. The MRI machine measures both my brain structure and my brain activity, and we want to link this to sleep. So for about 100 nights, I got both a brain MRI and the sleep EEG the night before, and that way we can link sleep to brain activity and brain structure. To avoid brain stimulation, each scan is done in the dark and I have to stare at a white cross. One of the main downsides of an MRI machine is that it makes a lot of noise. A single MRI scan takes about 35 minutes, which means that over the last two and a half years, I've spent about 60 hours in an MRI machine, which is the equivalent of two and a half full days. As I mentioned before, I've gotten over 100 brain MRIs, and here you see a couple of them. Of course, they look almost identical, but we're interested in the small changes between them that could tell us something about how my brain is reacting to changes in sleep, but also other outside influences. Once every three weeks after my MRI scan, I have my blood drawn. And I use this to measure the total amount of white blood cells I have in my blood, but also the amount of each subtype of white blood cell. And after that, I store part of the blood, the blood plasma, in a minus 80 degrees Celsius freezer so I can later measure the amount of inflammation in my blood. Here you see a plot of the concentration of white blood cells in my blood between 2017 on the left and 2020 on the right. And as you can see, there was a slight increase over time between 2017 and 2020. This could indicate a slight increase of inflammation in my blood due to the stress of finishing my PhD thesis, which was due at the end of 2019. There's also increasing evidence that there's a link between the bacteria in your gut and your brain and brain activity. So on the same day I get my MRI, I also take what is basically a poop sample and I either freeze it myself or I mail it to the lab where they freeze it for me. Everything I did so far, I basically do once a week, but there's also a lot of things I do every morning and evening. So when I just get up, I fill out a questionnaire about how I'm feeling. I also keep a dream diary. And as you can see, I could remember my dreams three times this week. I still have to analyze most of this data, but here you can see a word cloud of the most occurring words in my dream diary for the last three years. I also weigh myself every morning and every evening using a smart scale that additionally measures my fat percentage and my hydration. After that, I go downstairs and I do a urine test. This urine test basically measures the pH of my urine and a couple of other things. It's done with this strip that changes color. So I take a picture of it with my iPhone, which I can later analyze. After that comes the most tedious and least fun part of my project, filling out questionnaires. I fill out questionnaires every morning and evening and also during the day, answering about 250 questions about my mood, who I'm interacting with, what I'm doing and my general well-being. After that, I measure my blood glucose, so basically how much sugar there is in my blood, which I hope will tell me something about how well I slept. I also measure my core body temperature in both the morning and the evening. And I do this using three different techniques. I measure it rectally, on the forehead and in the ear. Rectal temperature measurements are generally considered to be the most accurate, followed by in-ear measurements and the most inaccurate are measurements on the forehead. I previously made a video about this, which I will link here and also in the description below. 
Next, I measure my blood oxygen saturation using a pulse oximeter, which basically tells you how much oxygen there is in your blood. Next, I measure my reaction speed, which I do using the psychomotor vigilance test, which basically measures how fast you can click when something appears on the screen. I also take a selfie each morning and each evening. Over the last three years, I've taken about 2000 selfies. My goal with these selfies is to see if a computer can predict how tired I am based on just a picture of myself in the morning or evening. For instance, based on how far my eyelids are opened. Every morning and every evening, I also measure my blood pressure. And I do this using two different devices. One is a wrist blood pressure monitor and one is a blood pressure monitor on the upper arm. I use two different devices because a wrist blood pressure monitor is said to be less reliable, but it's much easier to take with me on holidays. For a while, I also used the Muse headband to measure my brain waves and to meditate, but I found it had poor connection quality and it didn't help with the meditation. It was more distracting than helpful. There are also a lot of things that I track throughout the day. For instance, when I go to the toilet for a number two, I track how long I was in the toilet and I also track the consistency of the stool. And I do this using the Bristol stool chart, which you can see displayed in this smartphone app. I really love dark chocolate and I track my chocolate eating by writing the date and the time on the chocolate wrapper and later recording it in Excel. And to really prove my love of chocolate, I taped all the empty chocolate boxes on the wall of my old office. I also eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and before I eat them, I weigh them and record the number of grams into these customized hand counters. And the same goes for the number of milliliters of liquids I consume every day. I also have a Bluetooth enabled toothbrush that automatically tracks how long I brush my teeth. Of course, I also track my sports activities using different heart rate monitors and different fitness trackers. Now, a lot of the measurements that I do, I did not yet address, but this picture provides a short overview. I track, for instance, the air quality, environmental temperature, my time on the home trainer, my phone usage, the number of alcoholic units I drank, and many more things. And all combined, this takes 11 hours per week. So that was a week in my life. With this project, we can hopefully make some interesting discoveries and generate some new hypotheses. But of course, there are some limitations to a study like this. First of all, can any of the discoveries we make in me be generalized to other individuals? Well, I guess that's the most tricky question. I think it can definitely be generalized to some individuals. The question is, is it true for the whole population? And this is a question I cannot answer. It will be true for some things, but not for others. So that's why we're treating this study as hypothesis generating. So we see a certain thing and then we know to check that specific thing in other individuals and they don't have to track everything I do as well. Also, we found a second person now who's going to do a lot of the same tracking that I do. So he's going to get weekly sleep EGs and brain MRIs. So we can use that for validation as well. But that still leaves the question if it can be generalized to other people and also to a different gender, for instance. But that's to be discovered later. Another thing that is difficult about this type of study is that we cannot always determine causation. So we cannot always say that we know that A caused B, we just know that A and B showed the same pattern over time. Say for instance that we see that a certain part of my brain is more active after I had more deep sleep. That doesn't necessarily mean that the deep sleep caused my brain to be more active. It could also be that a third factor, say for instance sunlight, caused me to have more deep sleep and also caused that part of the brain to be more active. However, in the end, I'm just really passionate about science and about data, and I think the results coming out of this project are super cool. I could literally talk about this project for hours, but in the end, I hope it benefits science and teaches me how to be a more productive, less stressed and happier person. The project I presented here is really dear to me and it costs quite a lot of time to make this video. So if you enjoyed it, it would mean a lot if you would subscribe to my channel and consider giving the video a thumbs up. Because if you do that, the YouTube algorithm does fancy stuff and makes it easier for people to find my video. I also make videos about live tracking, data analysis and the quality of different fitness trackers like the Fitbit and the Aura Ring from a scientific perspective. For now, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any thoughts or comments about my project, please leave it in the comments below and see you in the next video.